Hello and welcome. My name is Carolyn Beeler. I'm the environment correspondent and editor at The World. This is a live question and answer about extreme weather, climate and health in crisis. Joining me is Dr. Renee Salas, who is the Yearby Fellow at the Center for Climate, Health and the Global Environment, or Sea Change, at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and a practicing emergency medicine physician at Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. If you have questions for us, mostly Renee, you can post them on Facebook at Forum HSPH and at PRI The World, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. This Q&A is jointly presented by the Forum at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and GBH. Um, Renee, thank you so much for joining us, and I'll try to be trying to get as many of our listener questions uh, to you as possible. Um, to start off with, though, uh, let's just hear a little bit about what brings you to this sort of intersection of emergency medicine and climate change. You know, an emergency room is not a place you might typically find a climate change researcher. Why do you wear these two different hats, and how did you come to these dual uh, career focuses? Well, thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. So I love analogies. You'll notice that through this half an hour conversation. But I think the river parable really rings true here for me. So in the emergency department, I feel like I am trying to pull drowning patients out of the river one at a time. And yet, as I pull one out, I see many more behind it. But if you start to walk upstream, you can actually stop what's actually causing these patients to be thrown into the river in the first place. And so I feel like a typical week for me, I'm running up and down this river. I'm not only being reminded why it's so critically important that we work upstream when I work at the patient level and see patients one-on-one, -on -one, but I also walk upstream and see the impact we can have to turn off the faucet and prevent patients from ending up there altogether. So from where I stand, the climate crisis is a health emergency. That's a really powerful analogy. Um, you mentioned, you know, you're seeing the health impacts in the emergency room. What are some of those health impacts of climate change that you're seeing in the emergency room, you know, even here in the Boston area, which is, you know, stereotypically a place people might not think would be the most impacted in, in the whole world. But of course, we know the, the impacts of climate change are being felt everywhere already. So what are some of those health impacts you're already seeing? Yeah, so... Climate change not only causes new diseases, but it worsens existing problems and often termed a threat multiplier. And the ways in which climate change harms health is enormously broad. Everything from heat and extreme weather, which I think we, we all are seeing in our headlines and recognize very clearly. And I think heat is our best studied pathway, but there's other ways in which health is harmed and that can include air quality implications such as aeroallergens from pollen levels being driven higher because of climate change or ground level ozone being driven by increased heat and sunlight. There's impacts to our food and water, vector borne illnesses and social factors like displacement. And all of this also combines with recognizing as a doctor, I can have all the knowledge in the world, but if I don't actually have the supplies in a building with which to optimally provide high quality healthcare, that I can't practice the way I want. And so we have to think about how our health systems are disrupted, whether that's damage to infrastructure or power outages or supply chain vulnerabilities. So all of that is a, a foundation with which to stand that I see climate change harming my patients in Boston here and now. And that's also on a continuum, another theme I think of climate change. And so for some people, it may just be worsening of their allergic rhinitis because of higher pollen levels or a cough because wildfire smoke is worsening air quality, all of the way to really severe illness and death, uh, including, for example, heat stroke and an outdoor construction worker. And so there was actually a global study uh, that used a methodology called detection and attribution, which tries to figure out exactly what are the fingerprints of climate change on these extreme events. And for the US data, they actually found that more than a third of heat related deaths in 210 cities across the US were actually attributable to climate change. And so as I see heat illness, I think about how I can make those ties even here in Boston, because if we don't make the diagnosis of how climate change is harming health, then we won't implement the right treatments. 
That's a really striking percentage. Um, and, and that kind of gets to a question, uh, you know, climate change is, 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 is uh, a lot of scientists like to call it global weirding. So you have weather and weather patterns that are atypical for a specific location. If we're talking about Boston or we're talking about the heat wave that was happening out uh, on the West Coast in Portland um, earlier this summer, you know, if you talk about a 100 degree day in a place like Boston or Portland, that's going to, you know, be, I, I would assume, some pretty deadly extreme heat, whereas in a place like Dubai or you know other parts other parts of the world that see that type of heat more typically, I would assume it's not going to be quite as deadly. Um, why why is this mismatch between what we're used to and what we're, pre we're prepared for? Why does that necessarily create you know more danger for folks than places that are a little more used to this type of heat? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And I, I think of a study that was published by some colleagues that actually looked to see at what temperature do peak hospitalizations occur for heat-related illness. And they found that it differs across different regions in the U.S. So for Arizona, which is typically really hot, it begins around 101 degrees Fahrenheit. But for Oregon, uh, it is actually, they see the spike at 81 degrees Fahrenheit. Now that really puts into context the Pacific uh, Northwest heat wave, given that they were seeing temperatures in Portland, Oregon of, of 116 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is astronomically above what the previous uh, peak was for heat related illness. So this brings me to sort of three concepts uh, and I'll call them the three B's uh, to uh, try to provide structure here. So it's the built environments, behavior and bodies are our three B's. So, our built infrastructure actually determines how we are best equipped to protect ourselves from heat. So for example, how many houses or buildings have air conditioning? And there is geographic differences in that. And our behavior is gonna be different in different regions because if you aren't used to extreme heat, you may not actually realize how dangerous it is and how you do need to change your behavior and or recognize what those signs are that you're beginning to experience heat related illness. And then the third B is our bodies and the fact that our bodies can actually acclimatize to heat. And so all of those are, I think, some of the ways in which we can see these geographic differences. The three Bs. Um, does that mean that like a heat wave that comes, you know, earlier than you might expect or, you know, extreme heat that's very seasonal, would that have more of an impact because your body is not, at, uh, not acclimatized to it by any means yet? Yeah, so it's an interesting point because, yeah, at the, at the beginning of heat waves and the beginning of a season, you can see increased harm. And I think it probably is, yeah, a combination of those, those two Bs, right, behavior and uh, perhaps our bodies adjusting. And so it's going to differ based off the amount of exposure that you have to these temperatures uh, and a lot of other factors. And, you know, I think the last piece, too, that we, we haven't brought up yet is the equity issues and recognizing that as we think about those, those three Bs, I'll call them, then we have to recognize that not everyone has the ability to optimally um, improve all of those conditions in order to minimize their heat exposure and best protect themselves. That is a perfect segue into our first couple of listener questions, actually, that were about um, equity. And there's two that are kind of similar, one from Lily and one from Lucas. Um, that kind of both ask, can you talk a bit more about the increased threats on low income and vulnerable populations when it comes to climate related health impacts? Um, what impact, Lucas kind of adds, what impact does socioeconomic status have, particularly for those who are less affluent? So you, you mentioned the health equ equity issue when it comes to being able to um, take some of the mitigating measures that might help protect you. What are some of the other um, you know, reasons why there are increased threats on uh, low income or vulnerable populations. Yeah, so climate change is not an equal opportunity harmer. And that's true both here within the US and around the globe and, and even geographically as certain areas of the world are warming faster than others. So I think about this, there seems to be a theme here in my, my three uh, points. But there's actually three areas that I think about in, in regards to vulnerability. And I think it's helpful to think in this way because I'm all about action. I'm an emergency medicine doctor. I wanna figure out what we can do. And so when I think about these three points, they're all levers that we can potentially act on. And those are susceptibility, exposure, and one's ability to adapt. 
And so one especially vulnerable population are Black, Indigenous, and other people of color who have long suffered um, health disparities as a result of structural racism and especially environmental racism. Now, environmental racism is in many ways a subtype of structural racism and recognizing that it's racial discrimination in policymaking and how regulations and laws are enforced. So thinking about why do we place pollution uh, filled industrial complexes and highways in certain communities versus others. So if we think about susceptibility, so individuals who are black, indigenous and other people of color are, for example, more likely to potentially suffer asthma due to higher air pollution exposure by living closer to power plants and highways. So they have an increased susceptibility. When we think about exposure, researchers have found that areas that were previously redlined, which is a now outlaw, outlawed housing practice uh, that targeted blacks, that those neighborhoods, even though, again, this, this is now outlawed, but those neighborhoods that were previously redlined are hotter than other neighborhoods around them. And so they actually have higher exposure to climate threats, notably heat, which we know has significant downstream health consequences. And then the ability to adapt. So the recent reports by AHRQ and others have found that individuals who are black indigenous and other people of color have been shown to be more likely to be uninsured or um, either uninsured or underinsured. And that actually some of the quality metrics that there is approximately a 40% decrease in quality measures um, outlined by that governmental agency. And so recognizing, right, that those are three areas that are, are multiple hits, and that's a, a really a big issue with climate change is that there are multiple ways in which different insults are harming health and exacerbating existing inequities. I want to ask you a question about a report that was really making a lot of headlines yesterday. A lot of folks watching might have seen this UN IPCC intergovernmental panel on climate change report that came out last week that the UN called Code Red for Humanity. Um, you know, finding that unless we take drastic, immediate action to cut carbon emissions, we're going to overshoot that target of limiting global warming to one and a half degrees Celsius by the early 2030s. Uh, it found that the two degree target, which is another temperature target that's written into the Paris Agreement, was still, you know, a little bit more within reach, a little bit uh, would require slightly, slightly less drastic, well, still major changes, but um, a little bit more within reach, I guess. Um, you know, these these targets we I talk about a lot as a reporter who covers climate change. You know, these policymakers talk a lot about these targets, one and a half degrees Celsius, two degrees Celsius. Those incremental changes might not sound like a lot if you're just thinking about the temperature outdoors. But can you talk a little bit about what um, difference in terms of health impacts are associated with those small incremental impacts? And then, you know, what that means for for taking action? Yeah, so when thinking about these degrees, uh, it can seem really small. Uh, and I think about the fact that doctors uh, often spend a lot of time managing glucose levels for people with diabetes or their sugar level. And we invest medication and money and other treatments to try to get the glucose values down within a healthy range. And so we already recognize that numbers matter and, and even small fractions matter. And I think the recognition is that every small fraction of warming has significant implications for health and equity. And so that means that what we do now will actually have enormous health benefits. And I view action on climate change as a prescription for improved health and equity. End of story. So we, Yes, this, this report, I think, was a, it was heavy, uh, even for those of us, and myself included, that works in this. There weren't any surprises in there, but I think it really shows that now is the time for action. And there is nothing harder for me than having a patient in front of me that I don't have a treatment for. But we have the treatments we need. We just need the political will. And so if we can urgently move now to be able to achieve the low or very low emission pathways, we can still try to limit warming to 1.5 if we are swift and collaborative and aggressive in doing this. 
And that is going to take all of us in order to do that. And so we have to walk arm in arm forward and uh, tackle this problem together because it's our responsibility in this moment being alive on earth now. I'm going to get to another question on action and what we can do in just a second from one of our viewers, but I want to reintroduce you and uh, tell folks where they can submit their questions. So I'm speaking now with Dr. Renee Salas, the Yerby Fellow at the Center for Climate Health and Global Environment at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. She's also a practicing emergency medicine physician at Mass General and Harvard Medical School. Uh, I'm Carolyn Beeler. I'm the environment correspondent and editor at The World. If you have questions that you'd like me to ask Renee, um, you can post them on Facebook at Forum HSPH and at PRI The World, or you can email them to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu, and I will throw those to Dr. Salas, just as many as we have time for. Um, and I want to get right now to one from uh, Sonia, another sort of equity, equity health impacts um, a question. What questions should state lawmakers be asking and what policies should state lawmakers be considering when it comes to mitigating the individual level and population level health related impacts of climate change, including health related impacts that exacerbate pre existing disparities among racial and ethnic minorities and income groups. So, um, you know, that, that question is about state lawmakers and what policies state lawmakers should be looking at. Yeah, so it brings up a, a great question and a great concept here in the United States and the fact that the way in which climate change harms health differs geographically. So there are wildfires in the West that we recognize that even those harms actually affect everyone across the country as, as we even saw here in New England with poor air quality because of uh, wildfire smoke. And so we have to first understand what are those exposures? And I fundamentally believe that evidence has to guide our, our path forward. I am continually humbled in my practice in the emergency department around understanding how diseases present and in atypical ways or being surprised by things. And so I think while that's true at the individual level, it's also true at the population level. And so we have to ask questions to understand who is most vulnerable, why are they most vulnerable, and then what are the best ways with which we can intervene on those levers? Again, getting back to exposure, susceptibility, and ability to adapt. And we need to really become nuanced in understanding how these interventions uh, truly are working or not working so that we, we can improve them. So do cooling centers work? If not, how do we need to improve that process? And I think, again, getting back to that diversity within the U.S., those questions are going to differ depending on where you live and the local cultural context uh, with which these, these policies and behavioral uh, changes are happening. So, yeah, I mean, big thing, who is vulnerable? Why are they vulnerable? And then really trying to use evidence to figure out exactly what we can do. Another listener or viewer question um, from Wei, I think it uh, might be pronounced. Um, what would you say are the best ways to engage young medical students and doctors in advocating for mitigation and adaptation strategies for climate change? Yeah, it's, it's something which my colleagues and I think about a lot because we as health professionals, and I wanna expand that actually to include public health professionals and social workers and even physical therapists, right? We are, everyone within the health community is joined together in this. And I think the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us that any illusions of there being divisions between public health and the medical community, I think hopefully have been erased in recognizing that what happens or doesn't happen in one clearly impacts the other. And so I think that the first piece is helping people within the health professions recognize that climate change is personal. It is here and now. It is affecting not only ourselves, but, but our patients, and that it actually impacts what we do day to day. And I think being able to, to recognize that then allows sort of a series of potential actions, again, sort of along the continuum. And so that can be everything from talking about it, helping people recognize those health connections, because Evidence has shown that health professionals are the optimal trusted messengers to deliver that information. And it's been shown even to be true for people who do not actually uh, engage much uh, with climate change. So those who have less, um, less belief in the, in the science. 
And so that's a really powerful platform. And we have seen the power of health professionals in the pandemic and trying to disseminate information. And we need to do that again for climate change. But then in addition, it also ends up how can we change our education? So what do we actually need to know as medical professionals in order to help protect our patients? Uh, we need a dynamic education because we recognize climate change is rapidly changing, for example, vector-borne disease distributions. And so doctors who practice in areas who maybe never have seen this disease before suddenly could be seeing rashes that might be Lyme disease. Uh, and then all the way you know, to recognizing how we can actually help healthcare itself be able to not contribute to the problem, so get to net zero in our emissions, uh, in addition to making sure our, our health structures and delivery system can be resilient to the extremes ahead. You just mentioned a couple of times the connections between the pandemic and climate change. I'm mm -hmm. wondering um, you know, if there were lessons learned about the response to the pandemic and you know, failures in that response and, and, and uh, successes in that response uh, that could be applied to, to climate change. I know you've written on this before. What, what are some of the lessons that you know, we should be taking from this pandemic to apply to climate change? Yeah, well, once again, sort of three main points. And I think you know, the first is recognizing that prevention has to be prioritized, just like greenhouse gases and um, the virus, um, SARS-CoV for, for COVID-19. Just like those don't respect country borders, similarly, we have to recognize that we have to stop things at the source. So getting back to the river analogy, we have to run upstream to prevent patients being in the river in the first place. And that is true both for the pandemic and for uh, climate change. Now, I wish we had something like a vaccine for climate change. The solutions are much more uh, interconnected, uh, but that means there's enormous opportunity to tackle multiple issues at once. The second uh, lesson learned that from my perspective is that we need a rapid coordinated global response. We have to recognize we are all in this together and what we do here does impact countries and people halfway around the globe and vice versa. And so the Paris Agreement in many ways can be viewed as the world's largest public health agreement. And so we need to hold true to that, again, recognizing and embracing the fact that action on climate change is a prescription for improved health and health equity. And then the third point is one I referenced before, and that's in regards to recognizing the powerful megaphone that health professionals have and the fact that we need to help people see that climate change is personal, that it affects them and their children and their loved ones and their neighbors. And so it's not about polar bears or icebergs, it's about us. Um, there's another uh, listener viewer question from the world's Facebook uh, page that I wanted to throw to you. So it's from Delinda. Um, how much is climate change projected to increase cases of respiratory failure or other health challenges due to fire smoke? I don't know if you have the specific stats on you, but um, what are the health implications of, of the smoke that, you know, we were even seeing on the, the east coast of the U.S. a, a few weeks ago? Um, you know, another speaking about the pandemic. Um, I know that's also exacerbated uh, COVID symptoms. So what, what should we be expecting when it comes to health impacts of fire smoke going forward? Yeah, it, since we're bringing in sort of air pollution, I'll, I'll make one additional point in that recognizing that fossil fuels is the common cause and the common driver for not only air pollution that we experience, especially in urban environments, but everywhere, uh, day to day, in addition to driving the climate change exposure pathways that we've been starting to touch on. And so we can have near term benefits by moving away from fossil fuels, uh, by uh, for the air pollution from fossil fuels, in addition to minimizing wildfire smoke uh, in the future by hopefully minimizing what those extreme events uh, and the harms will have. And so again, sort of running upstream. So the second point I'll, I'll, the question makes me think of is the importance of science and, and evidence in order to really drive our understanding so we can predict where the future harms are. And so, for example, the Environmental Protection Agency 
has uh, what's called CIRA, which is the Climate Change Impacts and Risk Analysis, where they forecast uh, what the harms are, not only for morbidity and mortality, but also for costs in regards to different exposure pathways. So wildfire smoke is one where we need to begin to understand. And to, when you pointed out the, the recent wonderful work by uh, Dr. Domenici and others in regards to the wildfire and COVID intersection is that these are all interconnected challenges. And so they're exacerbating each other and, and climate change is that threat multiplier. So we have to recognize these intercomplex uh, issues, but also recognize that then our solutions can allow us to begin to rise above all of these solutions or all of these issues at once, uh, the point I made earlier. Thank you for that. Um, I think we have uh, time for just a few more questions. We have about five minutes left. Um, here is another one on a specific uh, sort of public health intervention from Marissa. Have you or your prof profession in general seen a benefit from any public health databases or mapping that locates at-risk populations before emergencies happen? Is it common for cities or counties to have them? So that's a pretty specific question about public health mapping databases. I'm wondering if you, know, you wanna answer that and then also talk about if there are any other uh, specific interventions that you've seen or recommend or could think about in terms of uh, you know, preparing emergency departments or hospitals or health systems in general for the impacts of climate change. So it's, it gets back to that fundamental belief that we have to have data and evidence drive our path forward. And I think as real time as we can get that data, the better. I mean, imagine if we had real time surveillance that could actually allow emergency departments to know uh, when peak heat-related hospitalizations were occurring uh, or when those conditions were anticipated to occur. So I bring up a, a patient I saw. So there was an elderly gentleman whose wife called 911 because he was acting confused. And the EMS crew, who I knew well, when they climbed up to the top level of the uh, their apartment building, they opened the door and said they were hit by heat that felt like they were on the Sahara Desert. Now, this couple did not have air conditioning and only had one window, which was partially open. And so this gentleman's core temperature was actually 106 degrees Fahrenheit. So he was suffering from heat stroke. Now, I bring this up as an example of the way we have to add a climate lens to what we currently do. And that's all that means is understanding how climate change is impacting this now and how it's going to impact it in the future. So for example, could there be a flag within the electronic medical record system that acknowledges that temperatures are of sufficient uh, intensity to cause heat related illness? Because this patient's chief complaint was actually fever and instead it needed to be heat stroke. And so then they can actually ask about exposure to heat. And so I, that just exhibits one of many ways that we need to adapt our healthcare infrastructure and our clinical practice to help best optimize our improvement for patients uh, and especially for those most vulnerable. Thank you for that. Um, this might be our last question. I know you're all about action in the emergency department um, and also in the climate change world. What can we do to address um, these challenges? This question is from Sarah or Sara. Um, how can individuals begin to take action to combat, combat the climate crisis going on? Um, Let's see. Yeah, let's stick with that one. She has several about taking action, but what can individuals do to take action to address the climate crisis? Well, I would say not only address the climate crisis, but actually to also uh, the, the treatment for climate anxiety and despair is also action. And so doing something about it, and that's recognizing that we are pushing this boulder up the hill and it is gonna take a million, millions upon millions for us to be able to do it, but everyone has a role to play and their hand needs to be on that boulder in whatever small way. And so we need to start by talking about it, uh, making sure that people recognize that this is a health crisis first and foremost. Uh, and then moving beyond that, your range of actions can include, uh, again, anything along the continuum from trying to help protect your, your vulnerable neighbor, to talking to policymakers at the local and state level, to helping to incite the political will that we need in order to urgently and swiftly do what we have the technology and the ability to do. And that is to 
be able to transition away from fossil fuels and create a healthier and brighter future for all of us. But whatever you do, put your hand on that boulder and start pushing, it sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> whichever way suits you best. Uh, Dr. Salas, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for speaking with me and answering these questions from our listeners and viewers. Um, that concludes our discussion now. Thank you again for fielding everyone's questions. This Q&A has been jointly presented by the Forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the World from PRX and GBH. You can view the full discussion on the Harvard Chan YouTube channel and our Facebook pages at Forum HSPH and at PRI The World. Thank you all for joining us today.